Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure CES. Uh, get your Bibles ready. Uh, we are in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. Uh, we expect to be able to finish the book of Ephesians tonight. Uh, Sister Renee sent me a, a text uh, uh, saying that she's just worn out and, and she's not going to be able to make it tonight. So everybody pray for her to get plenty of rest and, and feel, feel better. Uh, thankfully, uh, I asked Sister Heather if she could fill in, and she was Johnny on the spot or Heather on the spot. So she's with us tonight. Welcome, Sister Heather. Why don't you say hi to everybody? Hey, everybody. I'm just pleased that I'm able to make it um, last minute notice and everything. Uh, hope I know I can never fill Renee's shoes, and I would never try, but hopefully I'll have something to contribute that's worthwhile. We've got a great passage for tonight, so it shouldn't be too difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amen. Yeah, nobody can fill Renee's shoes. That's no, no, no doubt about that. That video that she made yesterday was really awesome, but I could say that about all of her videos. Uh, Brother Ben, why don't you say hi to the congregation? Hello, everyone. Uh, it's very good to be here. Uh, again, it's great to have Heather, too. Renee will be missed, but uh heather you already sound very professional so uh you're doing great already <laughs> well thank you for that i don't know about <laughs> professional but i'm i'm a little more comfortable than i was the first friday night so that's yeah. a good thing. yeah now don't, hey, don't expect any any uh, check in the mail sister heather since he called you special <laughs> oh man and see i was starting to get my hopes up <laughs> Okay, uh, let me just look at the chat room real, real quick here. Uh, I see Hendricks asks a question. See, if you want to get my attention, you put it in all caps, um, in case you didn't know that. Hendricks writes, uh, how do you feel, Brother Luke? Uh, I've been feeling uh, better every day. I don't really feel sick anymore. I am uh, I'm just don't have all my strength back yet. And my voice are, get, will give out, and I, I still need cough medicine and this thing for my throat. And so, but I'm just thankful that I'm feeling so much better. So thank you everybody for your prayers and Brother Hendricks, thank you for asking. Um, okay, unless uh, either of you have something you need to say before we get started, um, let's get into the scriptures. Uh, Ephesians, <clears throat> hey, uh, Ben, I do think it would be wise if, if to have you continue doing the reading because uh, my voice will last longer. So why don't you read uh, verses one and two for us in the KJV? Uh, well, actually, mean eleven and twelve. We started. Oh, I'm sorry. What am I thinking? <laughs> I looked at one and two and said, "Oh yeah, one and two should go together." So let me look at eleven and twelve. Yeah, eleven and twelve would be good. Thank you. Okay, so eleven and twelve in the KJV. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Mm hmm Hmm. Hmm. Something's not matching. Oh, gosh, I had to set for the wrong chapter there. I was on chapter 5 looking at it and saying, that doesn't match. Uh, Okay, um, Ben, well, since you're doing the talk and you read it, why don't you give us your thoughts on 11 and 12? Okay, well, these are these are major, these are huge verses. Um, well, yeah, I mean, you know, that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Um, the, world, the word wiles um, is a kind of an antiquated word, I guess, or I don't know, wily coyote. <laughs> um, well, uh, so wiles basically means, you know, tricks, ploys, schemes, um, th things like that. He, this, Satan, you know, Satan knows, uh, well, his first uh, uh, goal is to keep, keep uh, people uh, unbelieving so they keep them unsaved. But once a believer becomes saved, well, then he wants to knock them off their, uh, off their rocker, essentially. And he has all kinds of ways of doing that. He can... Uh, deceive you through false try to try to deceive you through false doctrine uh, uh, tempt you in the flesh um, you know tempt you with uh, tr trials and tribulations uh, things like that um, and so you know th that's why we need we're, we're in a spiritual war I mean every day I think 
the, the, the <clears throat> moment we believe and we let our guard down is the minute, uh, you know, Satan is going to seize that opportunity. And we are in a real spiritual war um, every day. And I, I'm constantly reminded of that, especially as I get older. You know, as a young as a young believer, I just was kind of you know mostly happy that I was saved and, and didn't really concerned about being about growing. But through uh, because I was uh, not um, diligent or focused on the eternal and didn't think it might, the Christian life really mattered all that much. Uh, you know, as I read the Bible, I be, began to realize yes, it, it very much does matter, and God showed me that. Yes, even the, the the little things that you didn't think were big deals, a big deal, are, are very big deals. Uh, they can really, um, they they can again, you can you can. There's uh, spiritual defeat. Um, you can make you feel weak, and uh, again, just you know, again, there's, there's all kinds of things that try to distract you, you know, pull you in and get you off uh, off of God's word. Um, it's very subtle. It happens for me. It seems like it happens uh, over a course of days. Um, where I let my guard down and then next thing I know, I was like, what am I doing? I, you know, I feel weak again and I have to feel, I feel alarmed. I have to get right back into the word. I feel like to, uh, to armor back up. And again, that's just something I learned over time. It took me a while to learn that. Um, because we, we don't, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Um, Satan is always kind of tr trying to throw your old sins back in your face, make you feel like, oh, see, God's going to hold us against you or, or whatever. Um. Or, or just just make you feel condemned in general, and um, I, I, so Satan has all all kinds of ways of of, of uh, doing that um, through drugs, through overeating or poor eating, um, just just ways of, of trying to make you feel like you're nothing. Um, and there's so much more I could say on that, but um, let's see here. You know, I will say about, real quick about standing. You know, one verse that comes to mind a lot, a lot of lordshippers like to throw in our face is uh, Luke 12, um, 36. I'm sorry, Luke 21, 36, where he says, Jesus says, Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And so they, they again, they they try to say that these, this passage is to believers and that we're, if we're not accounted worthy, well, we won't escape these things and we won't be able to stand before the Son of Man, but we'll be condemned. To hell, essentially, and again, the, these verses are, are to Israel, unbelieving Israel, and they are uh, basically Christ's departing words to that generation that rejected him. Um, that he's basically saying farewell because uh, they will not see him again until they uh, say, "Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord." But uh, with regards to other verses, um, with about standing, that's a, I think it's an important word, important key word to the key in on and again we the, the with with regards to standing in the bible for believers there it's always with with regards to being uh with through faith through, uh grace through faith so for example Romans 5 2 says through whom we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of glory of God another verse is uh Romans 14 verse 4 uh says to, to his, his own master, he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. 1 Corinthians 5, 1 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, and in which you stand. And I loved how uh, last Sunday, Luke, where you said that a lot of people say, for 1 Corinthians 5, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 4, 1 through 4, is the gospel, and you kind of expand it. It says actually one through eight. But the thing you emphasize is that uh, you mentioned that most people they 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 believe that you know First Corinthians fifteen one through eight, but they don't stand in it. They not they're not taking their stand uh, in terms of their justification before a holy God. And I think you emphasized that, and that was an awesome uh, emphasis you made that I'll never forget. Uh, another verse is in Second Corinthians one twenty four. It says. Not that we have dominion over your faith, but we are fellow workers for your joy, for by faith you stand. First Peter 5.12 says, By Silvanus, our faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. Um, so again, uh, that's important. 
important to understand that we we stand uh, in God's grace through faith. Um, so I, I guess I'll stop there for now. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Amen. And well said. Um, now, Sister Heather, um, I, I don't know it, what you prefer. Would you would you like to comment based on just the KJV or would you like me to read? Uh, I like to read the Amplified before I comment. Uh, do you want me to read any other translation first or you want to just talk about the KJV? Um, I actually have the New King James, but yes, if you wanted to um, read something else, that would be great. But before you do, though, I would just like to say that was profound, Ben. I've never even imagined looking at verse 12 as your own flesh and blood. I've always heard it referred to as someone else's, and that really impacted me what you said. I'm I'm still processing that. <laughs> Yeah, amen. That's very true. Um, all right, I'll read it uh, in 11 and 12, uh, and then uh, in the Amplified, and then let's get your thoughts, sister. Uh, Put on the full armor of God, for his precepts are like the splendid armor of a heavily armed soldier, so that you may be able to successfully stand up against all the schemes and the strategies and the deceits of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, that is, contending only with physical opponents, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly supernatural places. Okay. Yeah, wow, that was awesome. Um yeah, I mean, you wouldn't go into a battle with nothing on. You wouldn't go to into even your work day with nothing on. Um, for one thing, it would probably be embarrassing. <laughs> but um, uh, so why would you go into a spiritual battle with no protection, no armor? And, and um, too many times we leave our Bibles on a shelf and let them get dusty. And I think that that is a serious mistake um if you're and it doesn't have to have to be a physical bible most of my reading gets done on an app but if you're not spending time in the word every day in some form or another how do you expect to stand up against the attacks that the enemy throws at you you can't rely on something that you remember from six months ago a, a couple of weeks ago or even a year ago um it's it just doesn't work that way you have to be feeding yourself um i actually heard a pastor once say that the reason that we read the word every day is to compress it into our souls so that when we're squeezed what comes out is the scriptures and i think that's a beautiful way of putting that um like i said earlier i've never heard anyone refer to that as um by, uh, wrestling against your own flesh and blood, but that so applies. And I think that that is a wonderful thing that I really need to put some more study and thought into because that was very profound. Um, I, I tend to look at it, um, well, in the past, up until Ben said that, I've always looked at it as when I meet somebody, no matter whether they're nice to me, whether they're not nice to me, however they are with me, um, I know that if there's a negative reaction or a negative um, exchange, that it's not the person that is necessarily coming against me, but it could be, you know, the enemy coming against me through that person. And so it makes for, it makes it much easier to forgive and to love and to show compassion to people who are not nice to you when you realize that it, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Very good. I, uh, yeah, I, I've never heard the point being uh, made before either. Uh, I do think that, uh, uh, there, there is a, an intended meaning in every verse. Uh, and that is, what did the author intend to convey? 
at the time you wrote it. And that is the correct uh, uh, understanding that we should all seek to discover. Um, now, there are many verses where we can actually have other insights. And, and uh, I'm not saying that the other insights are not correct, valid, and helpful. Uh, but I think we need to always respect, uh, first and foremost, what was the author intending to convey at the time? Um, uh, in, in this case, there's no harm done, but we know that many of the uh, enemies, uh, like we're talking about here in this spiritual this battle, many of the lordshippers and the, 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 the false teachers, uh, they're going to do the private interpretations on, on various verses, pull them out of context and, and come up with some new spiritual meaning of it because they can't face the fact of what it really meant. So they have to twist it. And that's why we call Renee the untwisted sister because she's so good at untwisting these false teachers uh, sayings. Um, but in this case, I do, I do see that the, um, uh, we, we wrestled not against flesh and blood. I, I think the intended meaning was to uh, say that the, the person that you're dealing with, uh, that's, their, that's a, a person made of flesh and blood, but they're, they're not the real problem. The real problem is the demonic forces behind it, either working through them knowingly or unknowingly, uh, but it could very well apply to the, the, a person uh, also, the, the, the person we're dealing with, and it could apply to uh, our, uh, our own flesh. I think that's the point that you said Ben, ben made, that our own flesh and blood is a problem also because we if we if we are in the flesh we know that uh, we're not walking in the spirit uh, but let me go back up to the first part put on the whole armor of god that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil um, i always thought of this now for almost 34 years i, I thought of it as uh, when you're getting ready to go into some spiritual battle. Like every time I went to street preach, as I'm driving over there, I'm praying and I'm I'm trying to put on this armor and and, and I'm praying, Lord, uh, uh, give me, uh, I, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Um, um, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. The devil flees from me in the name of Jesus. And I'm praying and quoting scripture and trying to build up my courage to go, street preaching because i know most of the time we have to deal with adversaries and uh but i i really think that the intended meaning here and what we really should be um, thinking of in this whole armor is paul is writing to us and telling us right now if you're not aware of it you need to understand you need to put on this armor of god right now and and, and leave it on don't, don't put it on and take it off, put it on and take it off. Think that you can put it on, take it off. And, no, put it on and always have it on you. Always be ready with this armor. Uh, so I used to think of it, as I said, as something to call upon it to do when you're about to engage. But I think really we're supposed to uh, put it on once and know that we've always got it on. Now it says when we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, um, I want to know, Heather or Ben, just yes or no, have you ever had uh, the devil, uh, it had to deal directly with the devil? Not that I have personally seen or felt like it was directly the devil. I have definitely dealt with people who were under demonic influence um, and you can tell their their expression just changes in an instant and it's they go from being okay to just snapping and looking like looking like the devil so i guess kind of but not really mm -hmm. all right uh, ben what, what would you say have you ever dealt directly with the devil uh, sure i have uh, you know uh, james says uh, resist the devil and he will flee from you so i'm i'm sure he he is uh he is looking uh, all the time for everyone, for someone to devour, and uh, he's devoured me a few times, uh, m more than I'd like to admit. Um, 
And so, absolutely. And by, by the way, I wasn't suggesting. I think uh, Heather, you might have you might have uh, misunderstood me. Uh, I I agree with you, uh, Luke, that these passages, uh, this passage is talking about, um, uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, uh, but principalities. I wasn't suggesting that. Uh, well, we definitely do. We definitely do wrestle with our own flesh and blood. I think that's that's obvious. But um, I I don't think that's what these verses are necessarily teaching. I was just saying that. Um, the that you know once a, once Satan knows that you're saved and he knows who's saved I, I I do believe that uh he he will do everything to get you to uh wrestle with your own flesh and blood but um but also too with spiritual forces and so um it's also you know we we also uh we, we wrestle with our own flesh for sure uh but uh because our our flesh is sin possessed and so um. It, it it's it our sin nature is alive and well we just have another nature as well a new nature a divine nature um but again they're at war with each other that's the that's why we're at war now um in fact um th that's when life got really hard for me i mean some people say ignorance is bliss and in some sense it is when you're an unbeliever but it's it's uh it may be bliss for a time uh but really it's not because you know you have no hope you have no future uh even even if it's unbeknownst to you, you know, if you're an atheist, for example, uh, even if it's unbeknownst to you that you have a judgment coming, uh, you don't have a future. You don't have any hope for the future. So, um, but um, yeah, that's all I was going to say. There is that. Yeah, but uh, Satan definitely uh, does. He he always tempts uh, tempts our flesh with short term pleasure, um, and that's why God gave us these great and precious, exceedingly precious promises, so that we have something greater. You know, anytime you're you're tempted with for short short term pleasure um, that's not only going to cause you to become spiritually weakened, um, but also too it, it it could cost you rewards if you know if it's prolonged and, and things like that. Uh, for you know there's various things that you can you can forfeit rewards, but God gave us something better, and that is um, long term lasting um, future rewards. Um, it, those are his great and precious promises. You know, Satan will promise us. Uh, uh, uh the, he promises us freedom S sin seems like it's freedom sometimes uh like oh i can't do that um, well you can but it's not beneficial to you so satan will uh use that to deceive you and uh, try to get you to commit a sin uh for short-term gain or short-term pleasure but as soon as it's over uh you feel you feel rotten and miserable and um but again it's it's a short-term uh fleeting whereas god's promises god's uh he wants to something better for you, and that's why he gives these great and precious promises that we can uh, earn rewards and, and, and whatnot. Okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Uh, I see that we've got some uh, uh, of the, the the devil and his uh, these principalities here in the chat room, and, and thank you uh, to the deacons, uh, the moderators, for dealing with the trolls uh, very well. Thank you. But um, no, I asked you the question, and I'm, maybe I should have emphasized, have you ever had to deal directly with the devil himself? Um, because there's a lot of people who uh, they automatically think that it's the devil that they're dealing with. And uh, there's um, one of the earliest church, uh, uh, the heresies that always tried to get in the church from the beginning and persist even today is, is called uh, Gnostic Manichaeanism. And it's it's uh, part of it is uh, what's called dualism, and that's believing that there is a two equal forces, uh, God and for good, and uh, the devil, and equal to God, but uh, in evil, and they oppose each other, but they're equal in, in uh, opponents. Um, but we know that uh, God and the devil are not equal, uh, and one of the things we know is that uh, God is omnipresent but the devil is not he he cannot be everywhere at the same time uh so uh, i'm sure that the devil is engaged and uh, uh it's good that we're warned about the devil himself but when you think of seven billion people in the world uh to think that the devil is is in, concerned with any one of us uh i think just the odds are, are quite uh, low unless Maybe what we're doing is so significant that the devil himself gets involved. There's a book by C.S. Lewis called Screw Tape Letters. It's a novel. It's interesting reading and so some interesting uh, theological points 
uh, theories made, but one of them is that the, the devil has a hierarchy of uh, these principalities, is this uh, organization of evil dem demons under his control and direction, and, and it's very organized and with a, a kind of a, a ranked system. Uh, and, and so I do think that what we're getting into here in these scriptures is, is what he was talking about. C.S. Lewis is saying this battle's going on, but it's not the devil himself because he's too busy to be occupied with us more, more than likely, but he has many demons uh, that he can, uh, uh, and, and an organization of evil to, uh, that is wor at work in the world. Uh, but let me get back to these scriptures. I'm, uh, it says um, that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Um, standing means that we're not retreating. Uh, we're, we're not going backward. No, we're not moving away. We're taking a stand. And uh, we, we are facing. We're, we're facing it and, and, and dealing with it, not turning our back. Not cowering. Uh, yeah. And, and, and. Um, if I remember correctly, uh, I don't think any of the armor uh, covers our back. Uh, so it's we're not intended to turn our back. We don't have any defense um, uh, there. Uh, but as long as we stand firm, uh, then uh, then we have the, the the ability to deal with these demonic forces. So we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. The principalities. Uh, let me see what it says on the Amplified about that, uh, 11. For we wrestle, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, contending with physical opponents, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this present darkness. So the way they're interpreting principalities uh, is really more the evil people in the world who are probably under influence and control of, of uh, the, the devil and the demons. Uh and so get back to uh, the KJV, it says, uh, against spiritual weakness in high places. So in high places, I don't think the high places is it's a spiritual realm, like we talk about the first, second, and third heavens. But uh, no, I think in high places is the it, it, people in, in uh, their kings, their uh, emperors, their presidents, their world leaders, people who have political power uh, or, uh, you know, economic power. That's the spiritual wickedness in high places. Um, all right, before we move on, uh, either of you, I almost called you Renee, Heather. <laughs> I said, would you, yeah, Heather, I heard that. <laughs> Heather or Ben, uh, would you like to comment further on 11 and 12? I mean, 12 and 13. I have something I can add, but uh, Heather, if you want to say something, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, um, I'm sorry. I don't know how I misunderstood you. Um, I thought that's what you were saying, but um, it does work for that, but yep. it's not yep. directly written for that. So, um, but yeah, uh, uh, that's all I had. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I, one thing you said earlier too, Luke, and I, I, I like to mention this. I, I think that's a, this is very important. I think a lesson for me. Uh, and I think the Bible teaches this. That there's there's only one and there's only one proper interpretation. There's many applications, but only one proper interpretation. So one interpretation, but there could be many applications, like practical applications or manifestations of, of of how you could apply that to different areas in life or other areas of Scripture. Um, but one thing, that, um, Heather, you blew, you uh, you uh, really kind of blew me away um, when you said. You know, you don't even go to work until unless you suit up properly. You don't you don't do any job really unless you suit up properly. And one thing that occurred to me recently, I've been tr kind of studying the the idea of spiritual nakedness throughout the Bible. Uh, again, spiritual nakedness it's a common theme all throughout the Bible, um, and it might surprise you. Um, so, for example, uh, you know, it was said in the Bible that Satan was um, a covering cherub. A covering cherub, and I, I read elsewhere. I read somewhere at one point that, like the 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 Hebrew in that uh, the Hebrew in that verse uh, basically means that he was not he was actually a, above God's head. Like in, in in heaven, he was like a covering cherub above God's head, like, almost like a a headpiece where he covered him that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, I've heard that too. Yeah, 
And so I, I, you know, I kind of think, you know, like, okay, well, why? Do, so I wonder, wondered, thinking about that, it's like, you know, and he was, the Bible also said that he was the, the sum of, of, and the seal of beauty and wisdom. And again, Satan is the kind of a picture of the law. And I always saw that, you know, I always kind of thought that God uh, was, you know, again, the, you have the fruits of the Holy Spirit, which is God, essentially. And then outside, I always kind of saw God as in a bubble. And outside that bubble was like a protective layer. And it was the law. It was, uh, it was beautiful. It's wisdom. But it's not, it's, it's, it only hides what the true glory is inside. Just like the law isn't, it's, 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 it's fading away. It, it, it's glorious. It, it's beautiful. The law is, but it's, it's inferior uh, to Christ, who is grace. And, um, you know, so Christ fulfilled the law. He's above the law in that sense, uh, but he's greater than it. And uh, even like the old, in the new Jerusalem, it, you know, the, it's inside is the glory of God, but outside it's got, it's ornamented with gold and jewels. And that's again, a picture of the law, just like the, the breastplate of the uh, ephod of the high priest, where inside they had an ephod out on the external. It was beautiful gold and, and festooned with stones, precious stones. But inside was the, uh, I think it's called the Urim and, Thur Urim and Thur Thumen, which is a picture of the Holy Spirit with the God's glory. Anyways, when Satan fell, I think he he looked down on God. He says, "Wow, I'm I'm a I'm above God already." You know, he probably thought, uh, "Not only am I going to rise above God, but I essentially already am because I'm, I'm above His head, and I'm covering Him." And so I think when he fell, he said, "Okay, I'm going to expose God because again, it's God's covering. I'm going to expose God's nakedness, um, it, which is God's glory." And he thought that you know he was he was gonna again expose God's nakedness and and, and make it uh, shameful or you know think, think think thinking that it was somehow shaming God, but it was really his undoing. Just like Christ became naked for us, um, you can see this all through the Bible. I mean, uh, you know, and, and like even the Old Testament, there's the law. It concealed, it covered what was greater, the New Testament. So the Old Testament. Uh, concealed the New Testament, the New Testament revealed the Old Testament. So you see that covering, revealing, concealing type of uh, protective clothing type of idea. Um, and even like when Ham, I think, when Ham was... Oh, uh, the other thing too is what, what Satan used the law, what was good, to make us weak, to, to shame us. And so when we ate, ate of the law, we were found naked. Uh, you know, God said, who, who told you you were naked? Um... And again, Christ became naked for us. Um, and then also, too, like when Ham, for example, he uncovered the nakedness of his father. And I believe that basically meant he had relations with 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 uh, his mother, essentially, because it says in Leviticus, um, he who um, uh, lays with his mother has exposed his father's nakedness. And why did he uh, try to sleep with his mother? I think it's because, again, back in the Old Testament, when when a blessing was given, like th there was laws with the blessing, like just like when Esau, when I'm uh, sorry, when Jacob cheated Esau of his blessing, there was no undoing it. He couldn't say, uh, you know, Isaac couldn't say, oh, I'm sorry, I accidentally gave the blessing to your son, your uh, your your younger brother. Uh, I'm gonna re, re give the blessing to Esau because it was mistaken. No, it, once it was done, it was done. Like the law, the law is like final, <laughs> and. What's interesting is that, you know, when uh, I think Cam, what he thought he was going to do is he was going to get uh, a greater part of the, um, again, he tried to exploit the law, tried to use the law for his own gain, just like Satan did. He tried, So Satan tried to use the law to make man weak and himself strong uh, because he basically came had the power over death at that point after he, he fooled man, uh, Eve into taking it. And... Um, and I think Ham would basically want to do. He wanted to get a greater part of the uh, blessing. Uh, so you know, for example, Noah said, "I'm going to enlarge, uh, enlarge Japheth," and but but Ham, you're actually going to have the smallest portion, and your son is going to be cursed. And and but I think Ham, what he want, what he wanted to do, tried to do, is you soup, use the law, uh, that law of blessing of of becoming, you know, if you're, to, so that his son would get an equal portion. As the rest of the brothers, and he probably thought, okay, well, not only is my son Ham's going to get an equal portion uh, as myself, but also I'm going to require, I'm going to, because he's under me, I'm going to make him give his birthright to me. So again, Ham thought he was going to gain some advantage through the law, through exposing nakedness. And so again, uh, I think it's a really fascinating idea 
and you could there's all kinds of things too. Oh, another thing too. I, at first, I kind of thought like, okay, hey, am I taking this too far? And then it occurred to me just out of nowhere that when um, in Elijah in the Old Testament, the children who laughed at him said, "Hey, Baldy, hey, Baldy," like he had no covering uh, over his head. Uh, it, it, you could just watch this over and over again, and um, you see see him on so many so many themes of, of this nakedness where Satan tries to expose our nakedness, and it, it's interesting that here God uh, Paul's telling us to. Uh, you know, suit up with the with the full armor of God and His righteousness, which which uh, is revealed in His Word. Um, I was going to say one last thing. Uh, I'll come to me later, but I thought that was interesting. Okay, thank you. Well, I've been looking at the comments in the chat room, and there were some comments uh, refuting my take on uh, high places, uh, and, and I was saying that high places is people in. Uh, uh, power and authority in the governments. Uh, and so I took another look um, based upon the, the criticism in the chat room. And when I looked at the um, translations of the uh, Amplified, the NABRE, and Young's Literal, they all seem to agree that uh, you're correct in the chat room, that the high places refers to a the maybe the, the second heaven. Uh, that thing, rather than the way I expressed it. Uh, it looks like uh, what confused me and I think led to my uh, mistake is um, the way it's written in the KJV against the rul rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. I was really basically tying those together as one point. But there's a comma there and the other translations take that as these are two different things. One is the first part is the rulers of darkness of this world. That's the political rulers, the kings, the people like that I, I was citing. But the second part, against spiritual wickedness in high places, the translations seem to agree that that's referring to maybe the, the second heaven where the uh, uh, the the, the uh, uh, demons dwell. So um, thank yeah, you. Yeah, actually, the New King James does say um, heavenly places. So yeah. So thank you to the, the chat room for arguing against my position, and I think I have to recant that. Uh, all right, let's go to uh, back to the. Um, we didn't haven't made much progress, have we? Man, twelve and thirteen. Uh, uh, ben, would you read? Uh, let me see. Read fourteen, fifteen, and sixteen together, if you will, Ben. KJV. Okay, I don't think we actually read thirteen, so I'll do thirteen through sixteen. Uh, we didn't read 13? I never read 13. We just did 11 and 12. Okay, yeah. Uh, no, let's just read, read 13 because there's a period there. So okay. that should be one thought. Go, go ahead. Okay. Wherefore take, unto, wherefore, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. All right. Sister Heather, would you like to go first on verse 13? Um, well, this is pretty much what we've been talking about, I think. Um, we're, we're supposed to take up the full armor of God um, so that we can stand. And I really don't have anything extra to add to that, I don't think. Um, it, I think it ties in very well with 11 and 12. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll get Ben's thoughts, uh, but I'll read it in the, in the Amplified, and maybe maybe you'll have more to say after that. But Ben, go ahead with verse 13. Well, I agree with Heather. I kind of covered my other thoughts earlier where it says, again, he says the word stand again. So he's, he's saying that word stand again. And mm -hmm. I mentioned before that uh, standing is not in the law or in your own might or your own strength. It's it's in God's grace. It's through faith in God's grace uh, and, and yielding to the Holy Spirit who wants to strengthen you and we can one way you can strengthen you is like like heather said uh that it, it, it is to get the word in you and get the word in you and um so that when you are depressed what comes out is the word of god and his power um and that's what you know what when christ was tempted by satan he used the word of god against him uh so i think that's a uh, very uh significant um, also, too, just to follow up on your last point about the principalities and high places, um, I, I think it is referring uh, to, to principalities like uh, you know, uh, uh, Satan's uh, hierarchy, uh, so to speak. 
Uh, but also too, uh, I see that I do uh, like you said, Luke. I think I do see uh, he him using uh, people, real people, to uh, to uh, enact his uh, plans. So, for example, you know, Jesus said to the Pharisees, "You are of your father, the devil." And whenever the Bible says you are of your father, or you're the father of, or you're the mother of, it's always it's always in relation to you're reflecting that person's character. And that person they're referring to is the always the first person in the Bible that is uh, that meant it that is uh, documented to to um, to uh, exhibit that behavior. So Satan uh, essentially was the first murderer because he murdered uh, mankind. And so they, they they became they were reflecting the father your, their father the devil his character and I'm sure Satan was influencing him in fact he he inhabited Judas after all uh, but um, so th those I you know I see the spiritual high, people in uh, spiritual uh, positions using people in high positions like the Pharisees uh, to enact their plans so. Um, I, I do believe a lot of the world powers are people who are, you know, that's it's very rare you'll find anyone of uh, high rank in this world with that, that cl claims to be a believer. Um, and even if they do, do they have the right gospel? So I think they do use those, uh, use people. All right, thank you. I'm going to look at it in the Amplified, verse 13, and maybe we'll have more insights. Uh, it says, therefore, put on the complete armor of God, so that you will be able to successfully resist and stand your ground in the evil day of danger. And having done everything that the crisis demands to stand firm in your place, fully prepared, immovable, victorious. <clears throat> now, uh, we were talking about this before we, we started the live broadcast. Uh, uh, ben and I were talking about Bible translations and the KJV only uh, advocates, uh, of which I was for 25 years. Um, I'm still KJV first, but I, I like to look at other translations in addition to it. Uh, but the, um, let me see, um, the Amplified some people wonder why you why do you have you chosen the amplified what's so good about it well um when we compare it to the kjv uh normally it agrees and expands or amplifies it and it's that's basically what we're the three of us are doing tonight here we're reading the kjv and then we are amplifying or expounding on what we read, trying to put into our own words and further elaborate the meaning of it. And that's all the Amplified is doing. So it gives us the benefit of having a fourth uh, person in the, in the uh, study tonight with us, uh, uh, Ben, Heather, myself, and the Amplified writer or committee, whoever they are. Um, so th that's what I like about it because it does expand and give us a further explanation of what it means. And most of the time, uh, we've discovered that it's quite helpful. And occasionally we find that there's a serious problem that we need to point out. Uh, and I think when we read verse 13, it does uh, add a little bit as far as uh, insights to, to the meaning of it. But you're right, Heather, your, your first impression is it's not a whole lot more that we're gonna get from verse 13 than what it just states. So Ben, let's go look um, at verse I uh, yeah, go ahead. I Heather. actually do have something though. Go ahead. Um, while while Ben was reading, um, uh, you know, uh, making his comment on thirteen, the verse that came to mind was Matthew seven twenty four, and it says, in the New King James, therefore whoever hears these things of mine and does them. I will liken him to a wise man who builds his house on a rock. The rain descended, the floods came, and the wind blew and beat against the house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. So when we're standing fast in the face of an attack, what are we standing on if not Jesus? And, and if we're standing on Jesus then we are covered in the armor of God because it all comes from him anyway. And I just got a picture in my mind of um, 
of standing on a rock and having Jesus be the armor and, you know, cover you and protect you. And we'll get into the pieces of the armor here shortly, but I just, that, that picture was just amazing. And I thought I'd share that. All right. Thank, thank you, sister. All right. Um, let me see. Uh, I think that the 14, 15, 16 needs to be read together, Ben. Okay. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breast breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Okay. All right, Ben. What do you say about those? Okay, well, I'm just going to read the King James, uh, New King James, because those are those are some strange words there. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Uh, well, I think, you know, again, um, people have, I know commentators have said much about, you know, I'm not sure if if this is, uh, if they're going too far with this or not, but they, you know, they, they kind of equate each part of the piece of armor with different aspects of our spiritual battle. Uh, so for example, they'll say the, uh, that the, the waist be girded with truth, um, that, you know, uh, the, 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 a belt was very important to a soldier, you know, it kept everything in place, uh, and the, and the soldier was able to tuck his clothes in, into his belt so that he could run and be ready to fight. So kind of gird up your loins. It's like take, taking up your long, your long clothing and tucking it in. So you're, you're not going to be, um encumbered by long clothing you're you're you know you're ready to run you're ready to you're ready for battle um the breastplate of righteousness um the you know breastplate protects vital organs uh in our chest essentially um and uh and so again the the, the righteousness is christ righteousness uh not our own righteousness we're not talking about physical armor here we're talking about spiritual armor here um and again, uh, you, it, it's with Christ's righteousness, we have a positional, it kind of speaks to its positional uh, standing that we have in Christ. Uh, you know, once, once you believe on Christ, you receive his righteousness. Uh, this righteousness is given to everyone who believes. So everyone who believes in the finished work of Christ and the person and work of Christ receives his righteousness. And, uh, and so, uh, again, like I think you said this earlier, uh, Luke, is I think, uh, again, it's armor that we all have already. But it's it's something that we we need to remind ourselves, uh, it, you know, reckon ourselves dead to sin and alive to God, ready for battle every day. So uh, even though we have this armor in a, I think, in an eternal sense, um, on our daily walk sense, or you know, we, we Satan will come and uh, again he, he roars, goes about like a roaring lion, and it, it's our armor, our our position in Christ, that God's. Uh, word his power uh, is the only way we can we can stand and like you said uh not shrink away um and you know throw up the white flag of the surrender no we're supposed to we're supposed to uh not you know not cower in a corner but we're supposed to engage engage in battle um and again it's not our might but it's, it's christ's um let's see what else oh uh, the gospel of peace uh that's uh, obviously that and that's interesting it, it covers one's feet um What's that verse in the Bible that says how how beautiful are the are the feet of the one who uh, uh, has the message of peace or the gospel? I, I'm sure look you have you know that verse. Um, it's interesting here that we see that here with with the, with regards to the feet. It's the gospel, and and not only the gospel that we should preach to others. It's something we should preach to ourselves. I preach the gospel to myself daily, uh, and I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not ashamed to admit that. I I need that regular reminder. Um, so uh, that's all I have for, for those verses. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks. How about you, Sister Heather? Well, Brother Luke, I know how much you hate being the only one on camera. And even though I was this, I was not prepared and um, I uh, am, am not made up or anything or dressed up. I'm wearing my bathrobe just like you. I am going to turn on my camera for a minute because I have you out of my, my um, bedroom and in my prayer closet hang on a second i need to show you something let me see hi guys 
see my bathrobe just like brother luke's <laughs> <laughs> so this is my closet and it's very very messy because it's christmas time so there's boxes everywhere so i'm kind of squished in here but um this is um my depiction of the armor of god that i have on my wall in my prayer closet and um i just would like to share this with you guys um okay so i've got 14 through 17 on here so i'm just going to cover them all and then y'all can skip me when you get to the next verses but um uh we've got the breastplate of righteousness um and you notice the the breastplate is over the heart it protects your heart and it says um righteousness of the righteousness of god protects your heart um satan attacks our hearts emotions self-worth and trust he accuses us of being guilty all the time he actually stands before god's throne accusing us um the belt of truth protects your will satan fights i'm making sure i can you guys can see what i'm reading satan fights with us only believers have god's truth um and then the boots of peace is if you can see this here it says good news um it's showing that we're to be available and ready to go at any moment the, the enemy wants us to think that telling others the good news is worthless and hopeless so our task is to take the good news to people and then the shield of faith this is one of my favorites the enemy attacks us. Okay, let me make sure you can see it. The enemy attacks us with insults, setbacks, and temptations. Refuse to believe the lies. And this was a big one for me. Um, growing up in a cult, this was important to me to remember to refuse to believe the lies. It protects us from the fiery arrows. And I have a note here cling to hope in christ and that's to remind me always to hold on to that because it's in my hand and i'm holding it and i'm just going to keep going since we're in here and um it's not very comfortable so i don't want to have to come back in later um the sword of the spirit is the word of god um when tempted trust in the truth of god's word and then the helmet of salvation protects your mind and identifies you as a member of God's army because it's got the obviously a, the helmet would have some sort of a symbol on it that would identify which army you were with so it, it's it identifies you as a member of God's army and then the enemy wants us to doubt our salvation and so keeping the helmet of salvation reminds us that um that we are saved and we're a part of his army but i thought y'all would enjoy that well i certainly did enjoy it i i'm sure the whole congregation enjoyed it and you know uh i think that uh, you know renee needed some rest tonight and i think it was uh uh the lord says hey Sister Heather wants to talk about these particular verses. She has something to say about these verses here. So you're you're quite prepared to talk about this armor of God, and I'm glad that you you shared that with us. Yeah, uh, but, this is this is one of my favorite parts of of Ephesians for sure. All right, um, let me see. I forgot where I was. Uh, Oh, yeah. Let me read it in the Amplified. Then I want to give you my thoughts on these verses. Uh, let me see. 14. So stand firm and hold your ground, having tightened the wide band of truth, that is personal integrity, moral courage, around your waist, and having put on the breastplate, plate of, breastplate of righteousness, uh, and that is an an upright heart and, and and having strapped on your feet the gospel of peace in preparation to face the enemy with firm-footed stability and the readiness produced by the good news okay 
Can't, did we do 16 also? Okay. Above all, lift up the protective shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flames, flaming arrows of the evil one. Okay. Uh, well, I, 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 I understand their, their, the, the way they expounded the, on that, but uh, I'll give you my own uh, expounding th with the KJV. Now, I know someone in the chat room objected to, objects to using the Amplified, says it's not the Word of God, and uh, I, I'm not saying it is. Um, for me, I, the way I personally, I'm not speaking for everybody here, but for me, I use the KJV as the final authority. Uh, I test everything against the KJV. Uh, and that's why when we find something wrong with the Amplified or any of the other translations that we look at, it gives us an opportunity to, to say, hey, be careful, because some of these modern translations, uh, there are some serious mistakes and problems, uh, particularly with the uh, adding a works uh, to the gospel. Uh, repenting of sin is, is a common mistake in the modern translations. So when we, we come across one of these verses, when we do read them and compare them, it gives us an opportunity to point out the mistakes in the other translations. But getting back to the KJV here, it says, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. So the truth is Jesus and the gospel. Uh, so this is this is what we uh, is the first thing he, he's mentioning here. And of course, that's that's the most important thing, knowing and believing the truth uh, and and having on the breastplate plate of righteousness. Yes, Ben, this is not our own righteousness. It's the imputed righteousness uh, of Christ that we, every believer receives. So we are righteous. We are in good standing with God uh, be, because of our faith in Jesus. We are considered in right standing. That's what righteousness is. Uh, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Uh, yeah, good point, Heather. Uh, this uh, The gospel of peace, why is it associated with feet? Because we're called to go out and share the gospel. Um, uh, some people argue that the, the um, Great Commission is not uh, not part of uh, uh, you know, for, for the church. Uh, that, that's I mean this is the, another part error of hyper dispensationalism. They think that's just uh, that was well, since Paul didn't write that that doesn't apply to the church. But um, yeah, we we do have the commission to go to the whole world and share the gospel and. and that's what this is telling us here, that the gospel of peace, uh, put, put your feet are shod with it because we're supposed to be on the move. Don't You don't just sit in one place and wait for someone to come to you. You go out to the world and present the gospel. Um, I hope I'm never called to be a missionary because uh, I don't know if I could answer that, that call, especially this point in my life, but uh, those people who do go around the world to share the gospel, I always felt fortunate that I could just go down the road and and uh, the Las Vegas gets about 30 to 40 million visitors a year. So instead of me going to the world, the world's coming to this street, the Las Vegas Boulevard the, uh, in Sin City, and I can park myself there and preach the gospel to the whole world. So, But we got to be willing to uh, use our feet to go out and, and find the people who need to hear the message. And we have this technology now so that we can, rather than physically walking, we can, uh, you know, walk through uh, searching on the internet for, for those and being, that's what we're doing here with this uh, Church of the Eternally Secure, uh, taking advantage of the, this technology to uh, do what we used to have to do with our feet. Uh, uh, then verse 16, above all, so this means more important than anything else, Taking the shield of faith. Yeah, uh, faith is, uh, I, I do think that um, this is one of the reasons that these instructions are given to us is this problem of people uh, having to deal with doubts and fears over their salvation. And, you know, this was a controversy in our congregation for a while, and we finally resolved it and, uh, and had to... Uh, um, separate from those who disagreed on this, but uh, there are real believers 
who truly have the Holy Spirit, that are born again believers as much as any of us here, and yet they uh, have sometimes had to deal with doubts and fears and worries about their salvation. And I think this is the primary reason for this armor of God is to uh, be, help us to deal with these false teachers who tell us as they're in, Paul uh, uh, had to deal with them and they call they were Judaizers saying that to Paul's churches that Paul's a false teacher and uh, you, you can't get saved by faith alone. You need to also get circumcised, keep the Sabbath follow the laws of Moses, continue doing animal sacrifices. So in other words, they were requiring people to convert to Judaism and believe in Jesus. And uh, this is the same thing today, except we call them the Lordship heretics, uh, where they're saying that uh, we have to uh, do something else because Christ didn't do enough for us. So it's up to us to do the rest. Um, so uh, the shield of faith, our faith is what we are using as our defense. So when these attacks come, our faith must be our defense. And wherewith we, ye shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. Uh, here it says wicked. In some of the other translations, it says the devil or the evil one. Let me see what it says in the Amplified. Uh, yeah, in the Amplified it says the evil one. And Young's literal says uh, evil one. Okay. Uh, ben or Heather, you want to say more about those three verses? Uh, I just want to say Heather's uh, uh, diagram there was a, it was amazing. That's that's exactly the kind of thing that I wanted to do too. Like I always want to you know splatter my walls with verses. But I really, uh, really just need to have something like simple like that. That just could, sums it all up. Um, one thing I thought was interesting is that uh, the, that uh, with with regards to the shield of faith, uh, I guess Roman soldiers used two kinds of shields. They used a round a round shield used in marching, so it was more like presentation, and then they had a larger rectangular one that was used in battle. And so Paul used the one the term that refers to the one that they the large one they used in battle. And so uh, th these are battle shields, uh, and, and they're for protection. And I think you know again, uh, God told Abraham that uh, I will be your, I am your shield, your great reward. Um, and the again, I think it's ideal is that the battle's not ours; it's really God's. We are just along for the ride. We are to to trust Him and uh, you know walk with Him and trust that He, he the battle's His. All we need to do is is again go along with it and believe in him. Um, just like Israel, when they defeated the, the enemies, the, God, it was God's battle. They just they were the instrument with, through which he worked. Um, so I think that's an important thing. None of this battle is ours. It's all God's. It's his strength that we rely on. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, yeah, I actually have something to add as well. Um, and it's, um, it's this. First of all, um, uh, I just wanted to say to Brother Luke, if God called you or anyone else to go, to go out and be a, min a missionary somewhere in the world, he would give you the strength of body, the strength of mind, and the and the strength of will to go do it. I, I truly believe that with all my heart. Secondly, I wanted to say that just because um, we are called to, I mean, well, be, since we are called to go, um, that does not necessarily mean that we have to go knocking on doors, although that would be amazing. It does not mean that we need to go stand on a street and preach um, like our brother Luke did, which would also be an amazing thing. But we go places every day. We go to the grocery store. We go to restaurants, maybe not so much this year, but we go places and there are people there. and while we are there we present the gospel or we can um just show love that people makes people double take and say wow that person's got something different what does that person have you know what i mean it's not necessarily just going out preaching which yes is a wonderful thing but that's not the only thing that um that means it doesn't mean just go 
preach. It also means go live your life and draw people with your life. So I thought that was kind of an important um, point to make. And um, we were talking about the shield of faith. And um, I just wanted to read the definition of faith that the Bible gives us, which is in Hebrews 11, 1. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And I think that knowing that definition is so incredibly important when you are trying to stand behind that shield of faith, because faith is believing without seeing. And it is, it's um, knowing that you're protected without any evidence, knowing that you're holding a shield of faith when you can't see anything in your hand and believing that God has your back no matter what. Amen. Thank you, sister. All right, Ben, uh, let's go to, uh, let me see, we did 16, 17, 18. Oh boy. I'm not sure where to stop. 17 and 18 seem like. Okay. All right. Read them together, please. Okay. 17 and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. All right. Sister Heather, you want to talk about 1718 first? I know you um, talked about 17 with your in your prayer yeah, closet. Yeah, I did in my prayer closet. And um speaking of my prayer closet, Ben, I actually do have other verses um tacked up in there around the room. I've also got pictures of family members to remind me to pray for them. And um I have not been able to use it since the whole lockdown situation because that's become my backup pantry. But um yeah, that's a great way. Pick two or three that you love and just put them up somewhere like that. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to talk about verse 18? Um, all right. So prayer is, is probably one of the most important tools that we have um, because it's our way of communicating with God. It's not just saying a prayer. It's also talking to him. Um, the same way that we would talk to somebody like a friend or a family member. Um, I've, I've found myself many, many times just looking up and saying, now what? Or looking up and saying, what am I going to do about this situation? And you don't even have to say, you know, Heavenly Father and, and call upon him that way. If you've got a relationship built with him, you already know he's listening you just say what you're thinking and and what you're needing and it's like a relationship it's, it's that's exactly what it is it's it's building that relationship with god um but when when the waves come um and when they when the the attacks come and the and the devil is standing right in your face no matter what form he's taking at that moment there's a lot of times well all the time the wisest action is just to say, help me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amen to that. There's a song I like by uh, the Staples Singers. Um, and, and it's just titled, Help Me Jesus. And really the only thing they say in the song and they repeat it over and over and over again is help me Jesus and thank you Jesus. And uh, that kind of became my constant prayer. Uh, and that's really what it all boils down to is help me and thank thank you and also supplication uh, or intercessory where help others help heather help ben help whoever i'm praying for so we're asking the lord to help us and we're continually thanking him and to me that's the simplest way to understand what prayer is besides the fact of just giving all your troubles over to the lord and all your problems and trusting the Lord with it. Uh, okay, Ben, uh, let's get your thoughts on those verses. Well, I, I again, I think uh, the, each of these kind of uh, 
our areas of armor kind of hits on a different aspect of our spiritual life. And I like how Heather uh, really nailed it when she said the breastplate is really protects the heart. Um, and that was amazing. And here, I think helmet of salvation uh, protects our mind uh, from the, the attacks of, of the world, uh, you know, of, of unbiblical worldviews, um, unbiblical thinking. Uh, that's why we're supposed to renew our mind with the word of God. And that's where uh, the sword of the spirit comes into play. Um, you know, Paul says the sword of the spirit. It, it, Hebrew says that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. And so, uh, and so it divides, uh, you know, it, it, it's got two sharp ends. And I think uh, you could, there's a lot of ways you could, you could apply that. But one way to apply it is uh, a sword, you know, one side is sharpness of grace. And the other side is the sharpness of the law. And I think we need to be, rightly divide um, these uh, are the verses, the word of God, so we can apply it appropriately. So we don't take verses that, that are uh, law oriented, that are uh, the audience in, in which the audience is, is for unbelievers, and grace verses that are applied to believers, and not mix those two up. And so the word of God helps us do that. And also, too, is like I mentioned before, when when uh, Satan when Satan came to tempt uh, Jesus, every time Christ rebuked him. Or responded with the word of God, uh, and that's what exactly what we, you know. Christ is our example in all things. Um, and then finally, prayer. Um, you know, the Bible says we are to pray without ceasing, and I always thought that was kind of weird. Like, well, I, I gotta do, I gotta work. You know, I got two other things. I gotta can't pray constantly. Uh, but I think what that means is it, it's when prayer without ceasing. It means like, okay, when you stop praying. When you and you have to do stop praying momentarily, um, you know when you do when you do have to have the opportunity to pray again, pick up right where you left off, and that way you pray without ceasing. You know you're not starting over again like it's some ritual, uh, repeating the same thing over and over again mindlessly. No, we're we're constantly praying to God, and um, and I it, and I agree with you. Look, one of the constant prayers I have is so simple. It's funny you say that because that's exactly what I say. Uh, you know, help me, help me, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I, I, I just find myself doing that so often just because that's, that's what's on my mind. And I, I really, it's, it's really heartfelt. Um, I really need his help and I, and I thank him when he, when he delivers and he always does. So that's all I have for those two verses. Okay, so I'm sorry. Th thank you, Ben. Um, yeah, Ben. Am amen. I, I, I've often talked about this idea of continually praying. Or, um, I, I, my favorite way that Paul expressed it is, is he says, "Continue instant in prayer." And you know, it's an odd way of putting the words together, I think. But I, I really believe that it's it's making the point that you just made, Ben. That uh, continue instant. In other words, you can't pray constantly every minute because part of it sometimes you're asleep sometimes sometimes you're occupied your mind is occupied on a task and you got to focus on it and you're not praying but uh, i believe we're instructed to instantly continue the prayer once our mind is freed from whatever it requires it when your mind is freed up habitually you should reflexively instantly get right back into talking to the Lord. And um, I, I do that quite often. I don't do it perfectly, but I believe that's what uh, is intended by continue instant in prayer. Uh, let me read these verses in the Amplified before I call the 17 and 18 in the Amplified says, uh, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, with all prayer and petition, pray with specific requests at all times, on every occasion and in every season, in the spirit. And with this in view, stay alert with all perseverance and petition, interceding in prayer for all God's people. Well, I think they did an excellent job uh, amplifying uh, or, or commenting uh, on those verses. <clears throat> um, 
So the uh, the idea of uh, the helmet of salvation, uh, yeah, I I was thinking the same thing, Ben. That that's that's on our head for a reason. Uh, you know that, that our mind should always be: I'm saved, I'm secure. I have salvation; it's guaranteed, it's settled. Nothing can change it. He will never leave me or forsake me. But if I have no faith, He remains faithful. He cannot deny Himself. So that these are the things I believe that this helmet of salvation, and I again I, I do think that uh, obviously there's there's other spiritual types of battles, but the spiritual battle that it seems to me is, is very common now. Matter of fact, some people are arguing that if you have this battle of doubt about your salvation or worry over your salvation or insecure of your salvation. That, then that proves that you were never saved. And we reject that entirely. Uh, a person who's truly saved can have these struggles. And I, I believe that there's plenty of verses in the entire book of Galatians and many of the points made in Corinthians uh, are, are talking about those people who went into apostasy. Uh, they really believers, and yet they get led into apostasy or uh, you know, doubting their salvation but they were truly saved. Uh, but so this portion here really, I think primarily is for that purpose. Um, not that there are not other kinds of spiritual attacks, but I think this is the primary reason for, for this. This is the primary spiritual battle. The a matter of fact, in, uh, in um, uh, C.S. Lewis's book that I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, Screw Tape Letters, uh, uh, the, it, it's, it's about the, the premise is that the, the, the devil and the demonic world has a hierarchy and they assign a demon to every person. And the demon's goal is to prevent you from get, ever getting saved. And if that fails, then to prevent you from ever growing and maturing and becoming uh, you know, fruitful. Uh, so uh, I, that's the battle that's going on. And uh, one of the ways that they can prevent you from becoming fruitful and, and maturing is to uh, cause you to have doubt your salvation. So the helmet of salvation is what is on our mind to keep our mind right and secure in this uh, salvation. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Let me see what it says in the Amplified about that again. Um, 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So, I mean, I think it's natural for us to think of the sword of the spirit to be the Holy Spirit. And yet the scripture says here, it's talking about the word of God. And the word of God, of course, is the scriptures. Because at least in the KJV, they don't capitalize word of God. Uh, if it was capitalized, let me look and see if it's capitalized anywhere else. Oh, see, in the Amplified, they capitalize Word of God. Let me see about the NABRE 17. Uh, and take, uh, which is the Word of God. It's not capitalized in NABRE and in Young's literal, uh, which is the saying of God. That's the Young's literal, instead of which is the Word of God. So if they capitalize it, uh, they're, they, they normally they capitalize it if they're saying this is a reference to God. Um, and, and the KJV is criticized because oftentimes uh, we think that it should be capitalized because it's talking about the deity of Christ when it says he or him and it's not capitalized. Uh, that's a criticism. But uh, in, in this case, it says word of God and it's not capitalized. Uh, what do you think? Do you think this is talking about the scriptures or the word of God, me meaning uh, Jesus pre-incarnate? Um, personally, I think that it could be both or either or well either both um because if jesus is the word which everyone pretty much agrees on that and the word of god that we have in our hands is is scripture and the scripture is the word of god then it's it's all the same thing and and it's jesus words to us it's god's words directly to us inspired and written for us to be able to access um, whenever we need them. So yeah, I believe it's both. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Ben, what do you think? 
Uh, I can see it being both, but I think the emphasis is on uh, the actual word of God, like scripture, because, um, again, like Hebrews, for example, refers to the word of God being sharper than a two-edged sword. Um, and, um, and I get it. I, I see that the, the literal word of God, scripture, being a God, God's gracious gift to us and our defensive weapon. Um just, just like again, Christ used it to uh, to uh, get fl- to, to, for Satan would uh, would go away or flee from him. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I tend to think it's the actual scripture. Uh, mm-hmm. Okay, um, and then verse eighteen, praying always with all prayer and supplication. So prayer, uh, we're not. It's not only telling us to continually pray every opportunity we have. Uh, but uh, also prayers and supplication. Supplication is asking God to pro- supply our needs uh, in the Spirit. Now, praying in the Spirit, uh, uh, how would you interpret that phrase, in the Spirit, praying in the Spirit, either of you? Well, I guess I would I would tend to think that uh, we should pray like for example, I think uh, I think I, there's somewhere else in the Bible. I don't remember what verse, but it says we often don't know what we should pray for, but the Spirit uh, 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 guides us. Or I can't remember exactly what the wording is. So I tend to think it's like okay, well, you know, just don't pr- pray vainly, like repetitiously, but pray where the where the Spirit's leading you. Uh, uh, not maybe and again, we might not always have the right words, but God knows what we intend to say in the Spirit. Um, I think the spirit intercedes and it kind of, you know, makes our, our prayers uh, coherent to God, even if, if we ourselves are not always making uh, sense. If someone were to, he- were to hear us, for example. Um, so that's how I kind of take it. Yes, that's what I was going to say as well. Um, it, it's the, the Holy Spirit interceding for us when our words come out mumbled or jumbled or in some other way um, incoherent. Um, it's it, it's through our moanings. It's through our tears. It's through, um, and I'll tell you, there are so many times in my life that, that I have felt like I just needed to pray, but I had no words because all I could do was weep. And that those are the moments when I just felt the Holy Spirit with me and, and yeah, I would say that that would be what it is. Allowing the Holy Spirit to speak for you when you don't have the words to say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The scriptures, that's exactly what the scriptures say. And it actually happens. Um, now, normally this is our stop time. But we have an issue because uh, there's only a few verses left in this entire book. And it was our plan to complete this. But I don't want to ask you to stay up later than than, uh, the scheduled time unless you're eager to do that. So, Ben and Heather, do you want? I think the remaining verses are are pretty much his goodbyes. So it probably won't take very long if you want to finish it. Uh, What do you would you like to do? Yeah, I say finish it. I'm okay with either 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 way you guys choose. Okay, I think that the, the, we spent a lot of time on the earlier verses, but I I think we'll make up for it by skimming through the rest of it a little more so. So, um, uh, Ben, read uh, read 19 and 20 together, please. Okay, one moment here. Let me just uh, get it pulled up here. Okay, ni- just 19 and 20. Yeah, 19 and 20. Okay. They seem together. Okay, so verse 19. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. <clears throat> okay. All right, sister. I don't remember whose turn it is to go first. Do you guys remember? I don't. <laughs> All right. Well, go ahead, Ben. 19 and 20. Well, uh, you guys mentioned earlier. I think Heather mentioned it earlier. She said that uh, Luke, if you if you were ever sent on a mission, uh, God would uh, empower you, uh, and I think that's exactly what P- P- Paul is saying here. Is that um, well? First of all, uh, we should you know if we reflect on all these spiritual all the spiritual armor and reckon it as ours, 
Uh, we should feel power. I mean, there are times where I feel empowered. I feel like I can walk through walls. I mean, I think I can do anything. And it, but it's only after I reflect on these things, on these truths. It doesn't come like automatically for me. I'm sure there, there probably could be times where God could supernaturally power me that empower me that way when it's needed. But uh, often I have to, uh, you know, I I have to, you know, take a, I'm not saying it takes like, you know, hours of meditation and you know. <laughs> anything like that. I'm just saying, uh, it, when, once we reflect on these truths and and sum them up and conclude, reckon ourselves who we are. Uh, that's a, that's a mighty empowering. Uh, that, that that's what God does. That's what God uses to empower us. And so to do this, uh, to do the very things that Paul just mentioned, uh, uh, I, I'm sure that's what he's going to be doing when he when he goes out and speaks boldly uh, the gospel, but also he's asking for uh, prayers. And we should, you know, he's asking for other prayers from the other saints. Um, we know that a, a prayer from a righteous person avails much, and that's not practical righteousness. That's a that's a believer. A, a, a prayer from a believer avails much. And so I, I don't think we should ever, ever discount our the power of prayer and uh you know, I think that's one of our most potent weapons. Um, and so, um, again, uh, Paul Paul wants Paul knows he should be speaking boldly because the gospel, the truth. I mean, uh, you know, Paul's in. I think these are called the Paul's of prison letters, uh, prison, prison epistles. I think this is the first of his prison epistles. I think the next one is Philippians, and there's like two others. So he actually was in prison, and yet we know the word of God. Uh, cannot be chained. Um, so uh, he knows that, and so I think he—that's what he's basically asking us for us. His—he knows all these things, but yet he still—he uh, still seeks uh, prayer for, from the other saints, so that he—he he may be uh, you know supernaturally emboldened to speak the gospel, because he is one of the few people out there sp speaking the true gospel, especially out to the Gentiles. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, Sister Heather? Yeah, and I think that this kind of um, ties back into that, the boots, like like um, Ben was pointing out. Um, Paul took complete and total advantage of what he had at his disposal to reach people um, with the gospel. He was literally chained in a prison, and he reached out. Um, I am absolutely positive that he was probably preaching to all of the other people who were there with him, not to mention the fact that he sent these letters out from prison and was able to reach people. His, his physical feet may not have moved, but God still moved his feet through his pen. Awesome. Thank you, sister. Well said. Um, <laughs> Okay, I'm going to read 1920 in the Amplified. It says, uh, And pray for me that words may be given to me when I open my mouth to proclaim boldly the mystery of the good news of salvation for which I am an ambassador in chains and pray that in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly and courageously as I should. Uh, that reminds me of the first prayer of the church. Uh, if you recall, after Pentecost, uh, Peter uh, led them in a prayer to for boldness because they knew that uh, uh, they needed to tell the good news, but we knew they knew that also it was uh, dangerous and it took courage to do it. Uh, I I often had that same feeling every time I went out to street preaches that I it took me at least a year of street preaching before um, I no longer had to deal with the, the fear. But uh, uh, in, in, even if you have fear, uh, you can pray for the boldness so that you can go ahead anyway in spite of the fear. And so uh, Paul's asking for the prayer uh, and that, that he would get have the word, he would get the right words from the Lord. Uh, I find that very interesting. Uh, especially when it comes to the gospel, because obviously he knew the gospel. He's preached it over and over and over again, written about it, spoken about it. Uh, why would he need to ask for the words? But uh, um, 
Uh, I remember that Jesus said, don't worry, uh, that uh, you'll, he will bring to remembrance the things and give you the words uh, when you're uh, uh, in ministry for him. Uh, stay alert with all perseverance and petition, interceding in prayer. Am I in the right verse still? Well, that was 19. No, that was on 18. Uh, for which I am an ambassador in chains. So yes, Ben, this is a prison epistle. It's the first of the prison epistles. And I think I said last week or the recently, I, I, I was estimating, I think this was written around 53 or AD or so, but now I realize it. No, it had to be written more. At the, the, uh, and Paul probably was uh, uh, killed, um, uh, executed around, I'm saying around 57 AD, I'm guessing 57 or 58. Uh, um, so this is near the end. Uh, so it's probably around 55 or 56 AD, I think when he, he wrote this, but he was in prison and, uh, so he's praying that proclaiming that I should speak boldly and courageously as I should. Do you think he had doubts and fears and was worried that he wouldn't have the courage to speak? He's asking for people to pray for him. So he would have that courage. Um, okay, any more on uh, those verses, or shall we move on? Uh, I'm good to move on. Okay. All right, so Ben, let me see. Now we're on uh, uh, 21. Yeah, read 21, please. Okay, just 21. Read 22. Yeah, I guess you can read the remaining verses. It all kind of flows together. Go ahead. The, the whole chapter? Yeah, the 21. Okay. Okay, but that ye also may know my affairs and how I do, Tychicus, <laughs> Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that ye might know our affairs and that he might comfort your hearts. Peace be to the brethren and faith, I'm sorry, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with you, with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sister Heather, uh, those are the closing re remarks. Give us your thoughts on that. Well, um, considering that I'm here tonight, um, standing in in a very small capacity to Renee, and the fact that Brother Luke is here, who is the king of dad jokes. I am going to end it like this. Very wise words. Very wise words. Very wise words. Sit down. Listen to Jesus. He already did it. Amen. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Amen to that. Uh... All right, I'll read that in the Amplified, and then I think we'll just about be finished. Uh, 21 uh, says, Now, so that you may know how I am and what I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, so that you may know how we are, and that he may comfort and encourage and strengthen your hearts. Peace be to the brothers and sisters and love joined with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with undying and incorruptible love. Yeah, I think that was um, beautifully uh, stated in the Amplified. And uh, so he's, he's saying goodbye, his goodbye. And uh, um, it's interesting how he's asking for them to be comforted when he's the one in prison. Um, well, I guess uh, there's not a lot, whole lot to really say about his, his farewell there, his final uh, uh, goodbye to, to them in the letter. But... Uh, uh, let's take a minute now, and uh, we probably ought to really take a lot more time, but 
uh, let's just take a minute to uh, give our thoughts on the book itself. As uh, uh, Heather, I, I assume you've been with us for all or most of these uh, studies of Ephesians, but uh, kind of a summary of what, what we learned from the book of Ephesians. Uh, let's start with Brother Ben, though. Well, just uh, these last couple of verses here, one thing I think is interesting is um, whenever you think, you know, a lot, a lot of times at the beginning, like the preamble of, of a uh, the opening salutation of a, uh, I forget, what's the opposite of salutation? I can't remember, the, but uh, salute, uh, something, whatever. Um, the beginning and the end of, of an epistle also seems like, it often seems like it's, it's just kind of like fluff or, you know, it's just, you know, you know, uh, niceties or whatever, but I find that, uh, uh there, there are always nice little nuggets in there. And so even, even these last verses here about, you know, Tychicus or Tychicus, um, I'm sure, you know, I, I'm sure that that, that, that verse will answer a question for you one day, <laughs> even though you can't think of it now, why would that matter? It might answer some cr chrono chronological issue for you or something. I, I, again, I believe God leaves those, all those things there for a reason. Um, and like you said, uh, Luke, also that it's amazing how, you know, Paul, even in prison, he's uh, still ministering to the saints and thinking not about his own best interest and not, you know, throwing up his hands saying, what was me? Uh, he knows the word of God's unchained and he is, uh, he's concerned about uh, letting it loose. Um, and with sincere, when the Bible says in sincerity, a lot of times it means uh, unhypocritically. And again, that that's kind of like grace. It's it's almost like for, for a word for grace. Like you you have a sincere love for Christ because you know He loves you. You know, we love Him because He first loved us. That's how grace works. Where uh, the law is makes you hypocritical. You know, you're only doing something because you are doing it out of self motivation. Um, so I think that's that's interesting uh, with regards to this overall book. Uh, I think it's a fascinating uh, epistle. I want it kind of started out with how uh, it started out with how God was. Well, it started kind of out with, again with doctrine, where um, and I think that's always a good teacher always does that. They start with a premise and then they try to use that premise, that truth, and and talk about how you can apply that. And so the early application or the I'm sorry, the early doctrine in of this uh, epistle was God reconciling all things uh, in Christ, in heaven and earth, in Christ. That was kind of like the first couple chapters. And they talk about the mystery of the church. And mystery basically means uh, uh, new, new revelation. Something that wasn't previously disclosed uh, in the Old Testament. And then he kind of uh, summarized it or cap, uh, capped it off with our spiritual warfare. Um, and so, again, God reconciled all things in Christ. We Now Christ is uh, building his church. And this is how we should use the tools that God gave us, the, the, the spiritual warfare, the armor that we've given, that's our spiritual warfare, to live out our, our, our Christian life. God didn't leave us, uh, saved us, and just leave us empty-handed and uh, left to fend for ourselves. He gave us uh, great great weapons of warfare to, be, uh, to live a victorious Christian life. Um, and with regards to principalities, uh, one thing that came to mind uh, is that, you know, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 2, verses 7 through 8 says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord, Lord of glory. So that's where you see the, the uh, I think, the, the principalities and powers in high places using the, uh, the flesh and blood to enact their plans by, you know, the Pharisees in, in wanting him to, uh, to be crucified. Again, had they known, uh, mm -hmm. they, you know, had they known, they wouldn't have done it because they, if they're really, they're undoing. Um, so this is a, this is an incredible ch uh, epistle. Mm -hmm. You know, it kind of covers a lot of ground. I mean, it covers the, again, God reconciling everything, the fall, everything in this world, everything in this fallen world, he's reconciling it to himself. Um, and he's he's doing it. Uh, he's, he's in the meantime until the the regeneration. He's building his church to be his representatives, his ambassadors. And uh, again, we we are we're not fighting against uh, flesh and blood. We're, we're fighting against spiritual powers, and that's why our weapons are also spiritual. Okay, thank you. 
All right, uh, Sister Heather, uh, what's your, what comes to mind as you, you think of the book of Ephesians? Well, first of all, I'd like to say it's one of my favorite books of the Bible. Um, I, I absolutely love the Pauline epistles. I didn't always feel that way um, before I, believe it or not, before I read them, I did not like them. I like that. Anyway, um, <laughs> just from the things that I had heard and, and, and whatever I did, I didn't like them. Um, but I absolutely love this book. Um, this is where we learn how we're saved. And um, it's uh, for anyone who doesn't know, which I'm sure everybody does know, but um, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10 are my absolute favorite verses. Um, and I'll read it real quickly. It just says, for by grace, you have been saved through faith and not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any one should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And I think it's important to state those are those good works that were that were um, prepared beforehand are not works that save us, but they're works that or, or and they're not done out of obligation, but they're done out of a heart that is head over heels in love with Jesus for saving us. So um, it's it's not to save us. It's not to keep us saved, but it's an expression of love that we give back. And it's it's out of that, that we do the things that we do. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I just think that this book is full of so much wisdom. And I, I do apologize. I know that that was kind of silly the way that I um, stated on the, the last part, but I know my sister Renee would have had so much to say about that. And I just, I don't know what um, what she would have said. So all I could think was very wise words and, and um, I know she would definitely have some for us. And if she's listening, I would love to see those in the comments under, under the video after it's posted up. So, but yes, I've been here and I've, I've truly enjoyed this study and I'm very much looking forward to Philippians next week. Okay. All right. Thank you, sister. Um, well, for some reason, I, I, I think it's partly because, I, you know, kind of I was sick and out of commission for a while and really actually just even too sick to even listen. Uh, and so I, I missed a little bit and it's been a while. So I was thinking, I don't even remember that much about this study. So I was kind of panicking, thinking, uh, how am I going to kind of summarize the, the, the book? Uh, I think the best thing I can come up with is um, I've talked to you before about how um, in the scriptures, in the, in the original, uh, there there were no chapter divisions. There were no verse numberings. Uh, uh, the, the, the chapters were done about a thousand years ago and the verse numberings were done about 600 years ago, 500 years ago. Uh, but there's something else uh, that is not part of the originals, but actually was added in some of the translations that I think is actually can be helpful. And that is uh, chapter titles and, uh, and uh, mid chapter uh, subtitles. So I think um, what I'll go through is, is just cite each of these uh, subtitles here so we can see how broad this book really is. Only six chapters. And yet, this is all that we've covered here. In his greeting, Paul defends his apostleship. He, he had to do that in Corinthians and, and in Galatians. And we see it here again, defending that he's actually an apostle. Um, he presents the plan of salvation and that uh, Christ has fulfilled it all for us. And the inheritance uh, through the Spirit that uh, and the idea of uh, the spirit being the earnest deposit until we get the glorified bodies uh, and the unity of the church, the Jews and Gentiles being one body, and that this is a mystery. Uh, and mystery not meaning that it's hard to understand, but it was just kept secret uh, uh, until the right time that the Gentiles and the Jews would be one body. 
that Jesus came for the whole world, not just Israel. Um, and then in chapter two, uh, that uh, we're made alive in Christ, the, the regeneration and uh, the uh, uh, and that we're all one in Christ, as, as I said earlier. Uh, and in chapter three, uh, Paul's stewardship and, and the, the mission for the church uh, to preach the gospel. And um, I do agree with your sister, Heather. Uh, I, I think the probably the most prominent verses that's quoted the most from uh, the book of Ephesians is 2, 8, and 9. I'm glad you included 10 because I believe those three verses there perfectly tell us what's what's required of us and then what's what's uh, um, uh, we should be doing. Uh, there, there's a difference between must and should. We, we, we don't have to do works to get saved, but we should do works after we're saved because we should want to serve the Lord. Uh, but what we must do is is believe. That's the one requirement. So those three verses really give us that per, whole perspective. Uh, and then the other verses we covered tonight, I think, that are most uh, quoted and uh, thought about, and, and that's the armor of God portion we covered tonight. Um, and then when we get into verse to chapter 4, um, it's more about the one uh, unity of the one body, and then the gifts, that we all have these different gifts, and there's a diversity of gifts. And and then uh, uh, the conduct. Then we, then we start getting into the conduct and talking about the practical things and how we are supposed to walk and live our lives as Christians, as ambassadors for Christ. And uh, we're told in, in, in chapter 5 to, to be imitators of God uh, and... Uh, we should be walking in the in the a light and in the spirit. Um, and then it talks about wives and husbands and the, the relationship there. Uh, that uh, well, there, there's another thing there that I think is quite uh, unfortunate too. Is that uh, when it talks about uh, wives submitting to your husbands, um, the the verse before that says submit yourselves one to another. And I've met a lot of men. I think some men. The only reason they want to be Christians is so they can say that, look, wives, you, wife, you have to submit to me they, so they can lord it over their wives. Uh, but they don't they ignore the verse that says submit to each other, which means your wife's included there. You should be submitting to your wife and, and, and trying to do everything you can to make your wife happy and put her ahead of yourself. Um, and then finally, we get to verse six that we covered tonight, and that's talking about the family relationships, uh, 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 ch children and, and their parents. At first, it talks about the children and the parents, the children to respect your parents. Parents, treat your children properly with respect so, so that you're not damaging them. Your relationship between your slaves and your masters. Uh, and then the battle, spiritual battle against evil and constant praying in his conclusion. So uh, I think that is helpful in the respect that it, it's, it's a, an amazing book for six chapters to cover all of those things. It's a book of theology, uh, doctrine, and practical living for us as Christians. So um, uh, let me see if uh, either of you would like to say anything else before we're finished. Nothing here. Okay. No, I'm good. All right, then. Um, as usual, I want to uh, thank the, the congregation for being here with us tonight. Uh, uh, I get I didn't really get to pay attention because I was trying to focus on the study, but I do get the impression that there were some trolls early on and they were dealt with uh, quite well. By the way, uh, Hendrix uh, gave me this answer, Ben. It says salutation and valediction. Okay. Yep. So that's the word that you were looking for, a valediction. I forget that. Okay. Thank you, Brother Hendricks. And thank you to uh, Hendricks uh, uh, and to uh, Brother Kevin, uh, Church for the Truth. Uh, you do an excellent job there as uh, deacons and, and help dealing with the problems in the church. Uh, they, they welcome you if you're new. Uh, they uh, uh, deal with any problems so that, that we can uh, we can actually carry on the uh the studies and the, these services uh, 
uh, and so we, you're greatly, greatly needed and appreciated. Thank you to the whole congregation. And Heather, I'm so happy that you were available and eager to, to, to join us tonight and, and fill in for Sister Renee. So again, thanks to everybody. Good night and bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.